my pager goes off just as I'm getting out of the shower. It's early Sunday evening and after being on call the whole weekend, getting a page is not a big deal. But after reading this particular page, I was struck by one letter. Please call now regarding traumas, in all caps. And that extra letter S really put a pit in my stomach. I'm a third year neurosurgery resident physician at this point and I'm on call at the Children's Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I call the page back as I'm putting on my scrubs and the ER doctor says to me, Omar, there's some sort of mass casualty going on in Waukesha and we need you and your attending to get here now. I said, I'm on my way. I get to the hospital and the scene is just pure chaos. Dozens of people are just running around. People are wearing those high visibility, those construction type vests. There's others with clipboards, walkie talkies. There's doctors, nurses, emergency medical technicians. The preparation and the scale of the preparation is something that I had never seen before. So what was my first move? Honestly, I retreat to the break room in the back of the emergency department. I find the coffee machine and I pour myself a cup of lukewarm coffee, partly because I know the night I'm about to have, but also because I just need a moment to collect myself. In the moments after, I, I join the head of the emergency department and the ambulance bay entrance, and behind her is this large whiteboard, and on it is scribbled the patient names, their ages, and the injuries of the kids that they knew were coming in. On it, I see the ages 7, 10, 12 years old. She says to me, Omar, we found out some guy drove his SUV through the Christmas parade in Waukesha. We're told that a lot of kids are gonna be coming in and some of them have known brain bleeds. I briefly turn around and I see that scene of chaos is now organized. There's now multiple teams of ER doctors, trauma surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurses and operating room staff all standing ready and waiting. I quickly run and I grab a few sheets of blank printer paper, I have my pen and my pen light, and I stand and I wait with them at the front. It's only at that moment that I had processed what she said and I could only think beyond, man, screw this guy, before it began. Child after child roll into the ER via ambulance space stretcher. Some of them were wearing these bright sparkly outfits with sequins, makeup and lip gloss. And it turns out some of the girls that were coming into the hospital were a part of a dance troupe that was participating in the actual parade. I began triaging the kids as they come in. Some of them surprisingly seemed fine. Others were more sick. Some of them were coming in with breathing tubes and one of the children had fixed and dilated pupils, which is a sign of serious injury to the brain. At that moment, I find out that my attending had arrived along with the help that he had called in. There's now a team of us, three pediatric neurosurgeons, there's two neurosurgery PAs and myself. We immediately rush two of the children to the operating room for emergency craniectomies, which is a life-saving procedure in which we're able to remove half of the skull to allow for the brain to swell. I stay back in the trauma bay in the emergency department to help continue to triage as kids continue to come in. And then comes Kenzie. Kenzie was confirmed to have a small epidural hematoma, which is a collection of blood between the skull and the outer covering of the brain. As she's rolling into her room, I see her screaming and crying. She's moving her arms and legs in protest of the doctors and nurses trying to examine her. She's wide awake and this is good. To be safe, I set up my computer station outside of her room so I could periodically check in on her as I just do some basic charting. A few minutes later, I notice less crying and I look up and Kenzie seems to be less awake. Her nurse notices as well and tries to wake her, but she's not waking up. And the anesthesiology doctors put in a breathing tube because she's having difficulty breathing. She then goes to get a repeat scan of her brain and it shows a significant worsening of that bleed. Kenzie goes to the operating room for a craniotomy emergently to remove that blood. By the end of the night, we would have done a total of five emergency neurosurgical procedures on children compared to the five that we normally do over the course of a month. That Sunday night eventually turns into Monday morning. And as the surgeries ended and I check in on all of the patients in the ICU, I finally make my way home and I hug my pregnant wife and I don't wanna let go. 
seeing the pain and the, and the torture on the families and the parents experiencing that is something that I do not wish upon my worst enemy. I somehow find it in me to close my eyes and sleep. Kenzie goes on to do quite well. Every day I got to see her progress and every day I got to see a glimmer of hope grow stronger, not only in her eyes, but her parents as well. And throughout this whole time, families of the patients at the hospital were bringing food donations to share with the hospital staff and other families. And this provided opportunities for us to bond. And those families truly provided healing through nourishment. On the day of Kenzie's discharge, I go into her room to take her staples out of her incision, which she handled like a champ. Afterwards, she handed me the squeezy toy of a sloth, which she happened to know was my favorite animal. And with her mom and her dad and her nurse surrounding her in bed, she tells me to squeeze this squeezy toy of the sloth. Naturally, I oblige. And when I do so, about two tablespoons of chocolate pudding squeeze <laughs> out of the butt of the sloth onto my hands and my scrubs, and everybody's laughing. Because they're all in on the joke. But nobody laughed harder than Kenzie did. She was clearly ready for discharge. It was only in the weeks after that I had truly processed what happened. One man drove his SUV through a parade. Six people, six souls were lost, and almost 62 others were seriously injured. But what happened afterwards is extremely important. A community had come together to overcome the heinous acts of one person. Seeing those bright, shiny vests, seeing the large whiteboard with the scribbles on it, seeing the teamwork of everybody involved, that's what it looks like. The lukewarm coffee and the food donations, that's what it smells and that's what it tastes like. And Kenzie's laugh, that's what it sounds like, a community coming together. Getting to remember that and getting to squeeze my toy sloth when times get rough are all that I truly need to keep myself going. Thank you. <laughs>